Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to this new video with a guest. You might recognize today's guest because we already did a video together a few months ago. Welcome, Natalia. Hi, Vincent. Thank you for inviting me again. Yeah, it's super nice to have you with me for another video. So we're going to talk once more about SwiftUI. This time we will focus on the text view in SwiftUI. And uh, what's really great when we want to talk about SwiftUI with you is that you actually worked on SwiftUI at Apple. So you have a very good uh, vantage point to talk about this framework. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I did a lot of work specifically on text APIs during my time at Apple. So that's the topic I'm really passionate about. So I'm really excited to hear the tips you're going to share. Uh, so yeah, today I would like to share some tips that I hope will help you to, to use uh, the text API to its full potential in your SwiftUI apps. Awesome. I'm really looking forward uh, to the tips you're going to share. But just before we go into it, I want to share that you've also given me a link for a discount on your book that is about SwiftUI. So we'll talk about it in more details at the end of the, of the video. But the link is in the description if you want to check it out. Great. So, um, let's take a look at the tips. Uh, the first thing I think is really important to understand about text and that the thing that can eliminate a lot of confusion later on is that uh, text has a few initializes, but it's not immediately obvious straight away which initializer gets called when you pass a string or a string variable to, to text. Let's take a look. So the first uh, text in our VStack takes um, a string literal. And I think it's like the most common initializer most people will use straight away. Uh, and the second example uh, takes a string variable. So we have a string defined separately, and then we pass a string to text. So what's not obvious, especially for people who are just starting with SwiftUI, is that these two initializers are different, and different things are happening under the hood in SwiftUI when we call the first or the second one. So the first initializer that takes a string literal actually implicitly converts that string literal to a localized string key. That's because the localized string key type in SwiftUI conforms to expressible by string literal protocol. Uh, and the second initializer will call uh, internally the initializer that takes a type that conforms to string protocol. And we can also confirm that by doing command click on the text, jump to definition, and then seeing which initializer is actually called. Uh, you can see that it's SwiftUI init with a localization, and it takes a localized string key. And the second one, we can see that it's an init that takes a type that conforms to string protocol. And we can also notice that it has a disfavored overload. Um, here, it means that the first initializer will be prioritized when there is a conflict. So because string actually also conforms to expressible by string literal, this initializer could also be called this way. But because it's disfavored overload, localized, localized string key will be prioritized. And internally, SwiftUI will first look for localizations in the bundle conform, uh, corresponding to the string. And if it doesn't find anything, it will just default to the key, the initial key. That's why we see hello world in both examples. So at this point, there is no difference to what users will see in the end. But to use other features of localized string key later on, it's important to understand when exactly this initializer gets called. And at this point, we can jump to my tip number two, which will illustrate this point in more detail. Uh, for example, when we use the initializer with localized string key in text, we can actually parse it a markdown string, and SwiftUI will automatically parse it and show rich text to the user. So we can see that our, the word world um, is now shown in bold. And we can even embed a link inside text. And this link will be automatically clickable and will go to hpsexample.com website. So this only happens when we pass a string literal to text. If we want to define markdown string separately and then pass it to text, then we should explicitly convert it to a localized string key. Uh, because otherwise, like we already know, the other initializer will be called and SwiftUI will just treat this as a regular string and will not parse it internally. So that's particularly useful if we want to localize uh, rich text. Uh, we, this way, our internationalization team can um, 
yeah, use the rich text directly in the translations. And Swiss UI will take care of the rest and uh, localize rich text for us. When we don't want uh, our string localized, but we still want to use Markdown, we can use the Foundation API, which is attributed string uh, created from a Markdown string. This way, Foundation will parse Markdown for us, and Swift UI text will just receive an attributed string directly, ready with the rich text attributes. So another important and subtle thing to note here is that when we use attributed string Markdown initializer, Foundation will parse Markdown slightly differently uh, to Swift UI. That's because it will not treat uh, new line characters and white spaces like Swift UI does. There's actually a special option in the Markdown passing options called inline on, I think, ignoring white spaces. You can take a look in the documentation to find out more about that option. Yeah, it tells uh, Swift UI internally to treat Markdown slightly differently because it's mostly used for localization. So this way we can put new line characters and uh, like white spaces inside the stream and they will be treated like we expect them to be treated in the regular stream, rather like, like in Markdown stream where new line characters actually get uh, omitted. Yeah, you can, you can try it out yourself and see, um, like try passing different streams and see how they're treated differently in different scenarios. Let's move on to tip number three and take a look uh, more closely at the Markdown links. Uh, so this is like a really uh, neat feature in Swift UI where we can just use the Markdown link construct and Swift UI will create a tappable link for us. Uh, if we want to customize it slightly, for example, change the color of that link, uh, we, can par uh, we can set tint in the environment of the text and the tint color will be given to the link. By default, it will take the accent color of your app or the tint that is set in the environment but we can overwrite it on the text by text basis. This way, all the links in this particular text view uh, would be pink, but at the moment we just have one. And uh, another tip uh, regarding links in text is that we can actually customize the, the action of that link. So by default, SwiftUI will open um, a web browser and open that website of the link when the user taps on it. But uh, we might want to pre-process that link or like the URL of the link, or we might actually want to call some other action and maybe present a different view inside the app. Uh, this way we can parse open URL action in the environment and define what we want to do inside that open URL action. Um, so here we just print that link was tapped and our return handle so that SwiftUI knows that it doesn't need to do anything extra for that link. We took care of it. Uh, sometimes you might want to pre-process the URL and then actually defer to SwiftUI to open the web browser. Uh, then we can still call the system action with the custom URL we created, so, but we keep handle here at the moment. So while still using this magical initializer with a localized string key, uh, we can do other things. For example, do what's called text interpolation. It's when we can insert another text inside the string literal that we pass the text. Because as we remember, this string literal is actually a localized string key. And localized string key in SwiftUI supports different types of interpolation. We can interpolate variables, uh, dates, um, images, and text view itself. This is useful for styling portions of text. For example, we might want just one word to be colored in a different color, or we can make it bold, or we can use any what's called text modifier, the modifier that returns text when applied to text. Let's take a look if we can yeah, jump here. We can see that this modifier for ground color actually returns text when it's applied to a text view. That's why we can interpolate another text view with that modifier inside the localized string key. And let's take a look at more examples of interpolation. Here, for example, we take in a date and put it inside the text view as well, like we did with the text in the previous example. And we're also applying a style to that date, which is relative. When we do that, SwiftUI does some more magic and actually updates it dynamically for us. As we can see in this window with the preview, the number of seconds left until our event is changing dynamically. We don't have to do anything particular for that. We don't have to set the time ourselves. This applies for dates with a relative style offset and let's take a look and timer. So uh, when we set these styles to the date, uh, SwiftUI creates dynamic dates for us implicitly. 
And I um, think this one also works with uh, with numbers, if I remember it correctly. With numbers, like a timer number. Uh, like no, timer with number. a number formatter. I remember seeing people showing how you can get the nice, you know, like 10K or 1M very easily with the same kind of syntax. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, we can interpolate it and then parse uh, what format we want. Yes, you're right. Uh, so if you look carefully here, uh, we can see that our date it changes, but it moves the UI when uh, the width of the number changes. That's because by default, we use a proportional font and are in the proportional font, the width of digits, it's actually different. For example, digit one is more narrow than digit five. That's why our UI jitters. If we want to fix that, uh, we can apply a monospace digit modifier to text, which uh, still keeps proportional font for everything else, but numbers will have monospaced font, which means that every digit will take the same width. So our UI will not jitter every time a second changes. Yes, it will move like when uh, two digits will have one digit here or here, but at least it doesn't jitter every single second, which I think is a big improvement uh, in the UI. Yeah, that's all the tips I wanted to share today. There are of course more. You can check out my website, neilcollison.com for more articles about text. I like this topic a lot. So, and there's actually a lot to learn about text in Swift UI, surprisingly, because it's the most basic component. Uh, but yeah, I like talking about it and writing articles about it. So yeah, check it out. And I think what's really uh, impressive is how short the code is when compared to the UI quit equ equivalent, but also how you retain uh, a good amount of, uh, of configuration. It's not just like a one size fits all and then uh, you're stuck with it. Uh, you can configure like the actions on the, on the click, uh, the way you want a date to be formatted. So uh, I always feel like if you want to start uh, an iOS app today, it's so much easier than it was uh, just four or five years ago. Yes, for sure. Less code and you can focus more on customizing your app rather than just like configuring auto layout and yeah, other things. Like, yes, your uh, kit stays more uh, customizable, I think, at the moment because uh, SwiftUI is catching up still, but um, it's definitely easier to start with SwiftUI and then you can always embed UI kit components when, when you need something more custom. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think your book is actually uh, about how to uh, interoperate UIKit and SwiftUI, if I remember it correctly. That's correct, yeah. Um, so I wrote it for UIKit developers who would like to start using SwiftUI in existing projects. Uh, and um, yeah, you don't need any SwiftUI knowledge to start it, just UIKit knowledge. And I will walk you through um, like the concepts of SwiftUI and then how to first start using it in small components in your apps. And the last chapter focuses on how you can actually uh, migrate your app to use SwiftUI app lifecycle, but still bring some UI kit components you already have in your project into the SwiftUI app. Yeah, and I can, I can share that uh, I've been using a similar approach uh, at work and uh, I've been really pleased to see that uh, when your view works well with SwiftUI, uh, you can win a ton of time. And there is not that strong of a barrier to entry to start integrating SwiftUI into a UIKit app. It's uh, it's been pretty uh, pretty well uh, well thought, and uh, it's quite easy. And it's not a one way door decision. Like you can always change your mind later and switch back the view to UIKit if you need to something that is like uh, just not possible or uh, you're not like locking yourself into something. Yes, for sure. Yeah, my um my process is normally I try to investigate if I can achieve what I need with SwiftUI and if it's not possible then I will fall back to UIKit. Yeah, basically the, the same. We've always the question of uh, the version of iOS that you support that is always like uh, coming mm -hmm. uh, coming into play. I think in the tips that you showed us, most of them require iOS uh, 15, if I'm correct. Uh, yes, uh, so markdown attributed stream changes were introduced in iOS 15, but the rest, like the initializers, the interpolation, uh, were introduced early on. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Natalia. Like I said in the intro, uh, if people want to buy your book, there is a link in the description with a discount that is valid uh, for the first people to buy the book through the link. So definitely uh, check it out. And um, your, the link to your blog will also be in the description. I can we basically recommend everyone to check it out. I know I follow your tips uh, regularly on Twitter and uh, I always learn a ton of things. So I can only recommend that people uh, follow you. And uh, thank you for joining me for this uh, second video. It was super nice. I've learned things. I hope the audience has learned things. I'm sure that they have learned things. Uh, yeah, thanks again for being uh, with me here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was great fun.
thank you and uh, thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye bye.